Father in heaven, we thank you. You've been gracious. You've been faithful. And indeed, we have seen your hand upon us. Thank you for blessing our church with new members. Because nothing makes us who we are without these men and women that you've added to us. If it was not that, we would not be gathered here today. And therefore, we celebrate them and we thank you, Father, for them. The Bible says, and the Lord added to the church as many as were being saved. Today, you've added 145 members, people to our church. And we are thankful. Lord, as we share the word of God for the next few minutes, may you bless the church and may you bless your people. May this be a moment of reflection that, Lord, you may help us to know it is a good thing to love God. We give you praise and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, we pray. And we together say, Amen. Amen. All right, be seated. Now, to help me, I will not go into the, in, into the recap of what we were doing last Sunday. I will simply pick it up from where I left last Sunday, and even if I can speak only one point, I will share that one point. I'll continue again when the Lord gives us opportunity. Now, we have been talking about synergy is not in numbers. That has been our topic. And uh, we began on what I'm calling here synergy is partnering with God. Partnering with God. And we saw the partner that we are talking about here is the helper whom Jesus promised his disciples in the name of the Holy Spirit. I ended the sermon last Sunday on a scripture in John chapter 14, verse 15 to verse 17. If you don't mind, open with me so that I can take your mind from where we put our comma. John chapter 14, verse 15 and verse 16. Here Jesus has finished his work on the cross. Jesus has died. Jesus has resurrected. And as I shared with you last Sunday, the death of Christ on the cross was all that God brought him to do. Now, I repeat again. If there was any assignment that Jesus had, it was for him to come and die on the cross for your sin. And as soon as Jesus had died on the cross, when he said it is finished, believe me, his assignment was over. Which, in my opinion, he had taken on his body on the cross, literally everything which the devil had taken away from you. He had forgiven your sins. He had healed your body. He had delivered you from all manner of bondages. He had given you that which you had lost by dying on that cross and saying, it is finished. In fact, I can say this with authority. It would have even been possible on that day when he resurrected to have just gone to heaven straight and tell the Father, I have done what you sent me to do. But Jesus didn't end like that. The Bible tells me he was around for another 40 days and 40 nights. I think that's where we ended. That 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was meant to prepare his disciples or prepare those that were his witnesses to be able to go out and proclaim, to go out and announce, to go out and tell the rest of the people that that man that you saw die on the cross, he's resurrected and he's alive. Their mission was for them to go to the whole world and proclaim that the, the, world, the sins of the world have been forgiven. And that God has already taken back man from the place where the devil had dislodged him. So before Jesus died, he talked to his disciples and he gave them this promise. If you look at John chapter 14, verse 15 to verse 17, and I want us to read together. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That was before he died. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he said, verse 15, and I will ask the Father who is in heaven. I'll ask the Father. And he will give you another helper. Another helper. Because Jesus understood that it is not possible for you, even after you've been forgiven or you are living in, on the face of this earth, to live without God. All the time he was with his disciples, they felt comforted because he was with them. He did miracles. He gave them food when they needed food. For the 12 disciples, he even paid their taxes. Like now, some of us will pay tax, more tax. Okay? He even went ahead and made sure that each one of them, for the three and a half years that he was with them, they were depending on him. But now the Lord is going to the Father. He has finished his task. He tells them, I will ask the Father, that is God, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. 
And he went further to speak. He says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Because if it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him and he dwells in you and will be in you. And I love verse 18. Verse 18 says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. What was Jesus talking about? Let me now talk here. Jesus was simply saying, as I leave, I will send you somebody who will be able to help you. To help you deliver the message. Deliver the, deliver, proclaim the good news. Because preaching the gospel is basically proclaiming of the good news. And the good news was very simple. That Jesus has, died, has come and he has died on the cross. And his death on the cross has paid the sins. He has paid for the sins of all people. I have been made to believe, and I want to declare this to all of us this morning, God has already forgiven you. In fact, everybody in the world, whether he's a Hindu or a Muslim or whatever, each person in the world, his sins has, has been forgiven. Because when Christ was dying on the cross, he died for the sins of all men. But the only challenge that we have, and this is where now the church comes in, is the challenge of proclaiming that so that people can hear, so that people can know that Jesus died for them. And when we proclaim and we tell people that Jesus died for them, they will believe and by believing, they will be saved. Are you listening to me? This job of, of proclaiming was given to the disciples of Jesus during those 40 days that Jesus was with them. You know, I came to discover that I didn't know the Bible the way I, 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 I thought I knew it. I've been reading this Bible for 46 years. But I kept on thinking that when Jesus rose from the grave, he went around telling people, I, I have resurrected, I am alive. I came to discover he never went around doing that. By the way, he had already finished his assignment. It is like you have, you have a debt. Maybe Mama Priscilla here actually has, is owning somebody some money, and that person wants to go and hang her. And she cannot do anything about it. And then Bishop Mlema hears about it, and then I go and tell Mama Priscilla, I have come to make sure that I help you, I deliver you from that debt. And then I go on the cross and I die for that debt, and I pay it. After I've died and I've paid for that debt, it will be upon Mama Priscilla to believe I have paid that debt. If she does not believe I've paid the debt, she'll continue holding it as guilty because she will think she's still dying or she'll still think she's going to be hanged because of that debt. Now, the, 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 the job or the mission of the church was for them now to advance that gospel, that good news, to tell the world that Jesus, whom they saw crucified, and whom they saw buried, that Jesus has resurrected. And that he's, he has now resur resurrected, he has gone to God the Father to prepare a new place for them where they're going to be. But how will they hear, the Bible says in the book of Romans, unless somebody is sent to preach? So listen to me. What I used to believe, I used to think Jesus for the 40 days, he was simply convincing the world that he was alive. I came to realize, no, he never did that. What Jesus did, because his assignment was over, and he knew he was going to give this assignment to, the, to, the, to, to his church, the people who believe in him, the Lord spent the 40 days and the 40 nights doing nothing but appearing to those that were his disciples and proving to them that he was alive. How do I know that? Let me show you a scripture that we just read about sometimes in the book of Mark chapter, Acts chapter 10, verse 38 to verse 44. I, it is important I'm repeating this one because I believe it's very key for you to know the need for the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38 to verse 45, this is Peter speaking to a group of men or, or the family meeting in the house of one called Cornelius. Cornelius was a, a, a Gentile. Gentiles that time were people who had no idea about God. And it was believed by the Jews that the Messiah was only meant for the Jews. So when Jesus was dying on the cross, they even re, re, uh, they put an inscription on his head. They said the king of the Jews because they thought it was only the Jew people that Jesus was dying for. And now Peter is preaching the gospel. God has spoken to Peter and he has told him, go to a house of a man called Cornelius. And he has gone to that house and he's talking to them. And as he's speaking to them, these were actually Gentiles. He is in the company of a few Jewish people and they are wondering what is actually happening. So the Bible says, and he began to speak and he told them, he, this man in the house of Cornelius, 
He said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power. Then he went further to explain. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Cornelius, Peter was referring to the three and a half years that Jesus was with his disciples. Because at the age of 30, he began his ministry. And during the time of his ministry, Jesus was doing nothing but simply doing good to prove to the world he's the Messiah, to tell the people I have come to spread the good news of the kingdom of God. He did good, he healed the sick. He cast out devils, he raised the dead, and did literally everything he could have done to show the world that he was the Messiah and the Savior. But he did not end there. He goes on to say in verse 39, and we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Then he says, and they put him to death by hanging him where? On the tree. He's now explaining to us the end of his ministry. They take Jesus and they hang him where? On the tree. This is now Peter speaking. Then he goes on to say in verse 40, but God, that's the good news, but God, what did God do? He raised him on the third day and made him to do what? To appear. You know, Jesus never made crusades after his resurrection. Put that in your head. I'm challenging you. If you're a Bible reader and you, believe, you don't believe what I'm saying, go read your Bible. Come to me and tell me, Bishop, there you spoke heresy. Listen to me. For the 40 days he was alive, he never conducted a mass crusade. And by the way, he, he, he never even walked just like a mere man on the streets of Jerusalem. He never did that. For those 40 days, Jesus appeared. I mentioned the word appearing last Sunday. Appearing simply means unexpected. That's the meaning of the word. If I say somebody has appeared here, it means you're not expecting him. We were in the service and the Holy Ghost appeared. Or we were in a meeting when we did our conference here, we had our guest ministers. Let me give a good example of appearing. And during the conference, one of our best friends, Reverend Stephen Wengam, happened by chance to land in Nairobi for a meeting. Just by chance. I told him we are having our conference. He says, would you mind if I can just appear? I said, you appear. I didn't tell anybody that he was coming. And while we were here, how many were here that day? While we are here, he opened the door and he walked in. It was like, it was like a, a ghost. People saw somebody walking in. And believe me, the preacher was preaching here. The someone was interrupted. Everybody began clapping hands. For him, they have forgotten the preacher. The reason was simple. What, what happened? He did what? He appeared. If we had told him he's coming, nobody would have clapped hands. So what Jesus did, he appeared. Eh? After he had been raised, God made him to appear. People would be walking like this. Jesus would just suddenly appear to them. Not anybody. I'll show you, it's not everybody. He would just appear to them and reveal to, and tell them, look, I am Jesus who died. Touch my hands. Touch my sight. So that this man can without any doubt know that this Jesus is alive. A good example, quickly, you'll find this example in the book of, uh, uh, in the book of uh, Matthew, uh, is it Luke? Luke chapter 24, verse 26 to 27. 24, 26 to 27. These are the two men who are coming from Emmaus, who are going to Emmaus. You remember the two men? Emmaus, going to Emmaus. These men were going to Emmaus, and they don't know Jesus is with them. Somehow, somebody from nowhere joined them, just from nowhere. And they began walking with him. As they were talking, he was listening. Then he began asking, asking questions. And then they asked him, are you the only one who is new in this place? They begin questioning why he doesn't know what is going on. Then Jesus keeps on talking and talking and talking. Look at what the Bible says. Jesus made this statement. He said, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then he went further in verse 26 says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, the Bible says he interpreted to them all in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, Jesus, without even these people knowing, he began teaching them, showing them. Here the Bible talks about Moses and talks about the prophets. The word Moses here is referring to the books of Moses, the law. And you'll see it clearly when he meets the other disciples. And those books were, can you somebody help me? Moses was the book of what? Genesis, the book of? Exodus, the book of? Deuter the book of? Deuteronomy, the book of? Numbers and? And Leviticus. 
he began to speak about those books. And believe me, all those books were talking about him. Then he went further and he spoke about the prophets. The prophets, Jeremiah, help me here. Isaiah, and who else? Haggai, all those men in the Bible were talking about him. To let us understand that the whole Bible is nothing but pointing us to Jesus. Listen to me. Everything written from Genesis to Revelation points people to Jesus. And it was simply pointing to Jesus on the cross. That's why Psalms can easily tell us he took, I mean, there's the Psalm that we, Isaiah that we like, that Isaiah 53 or whatever. Yeah? He, he, he took away our infirmities by his tribes who were healed and all that stuff. It was all pointing to him. Now, this man, the two men, as they were approaching their home, we know the story. Jesus went into the house with them and broke bread. The moment they ate the bread like this, poof, their eyes opened. And they saw it was Jesus. If you read the Bible, it tells us when they discovered it was Jesus, Jesus immediately disappeared. Because he had already revealed himself to them. He was simply appearing. I'm convincing you there was no crusade. The crusade was to be done by you. After Jesus has given you another helper, who is called who? Oh, you're good, you're good students. I think I've finished my sermon. Are you getting what I'm saying? I give another example quickly here. Look at the disciples now, the disciples. In chapter 24, verse 20, 44 to 48, the same look. 24, 44 to 48. I'm running like, uh, with speed because I, I, have, I told you I, I'm, I'm using a few minutes. It says, then he said to them, these are now the disciples, not the people from Ephesus. The disciples were gathered in the house. By the way, let me tell you, even some of the disciples decided to go fishing after he had died like Peter and a few others. In the evening, they gathered in a house. They were wondering because they had heard somebody talking about he has resurrected. So they were gathered asking each other questions, okay? Is it true? And there was one called Thomas who said, I don't believe until I see. So suddenly, as they were in the house, Jesus, poop, entered the house, appeared in the house. And he says, Thomas, I am the one. Told Thomas, touch here. He opened his, 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 his gown. He says, touch here. Then he made a statement which, which favors you and I. He said, blessed are those who believe without doing what? Have you believed in Jesus without seeing? Yes. You are blessed. Yes. And then suddenly he took bread, gave them, their eyes opened, and the Bible says, and Jesus disappeared. You will find that statement here. And he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything, can someone say everything? Everything written about me in the laws of Moses, the five books. And where? In the prophets. Then he added another one. And where? In the Psalms must be? I did mention yes, yes, this morning I said, even the Psalms that we read, they were pointing people to Jesus. When Solomon was writing the Psalms, David wrote part of the Psalms. And a few other great men wrote some of the Psalms. Even Moses wrote a Psalm. All these men were declaring about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you aware of that? Today we have got some funny Psalmists. I've been seeing on, 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 on social media. Somebody's having a meeting and then they say the following will be the Psalmists. Akina Tony. Psalmist Tony. Psalmist Aluda. And I was asking Aluda this morning, how many, how many things have you said? How many psalms have you written yourself to call yourself a psalmist? I'm not, I'm not dis discouraging them. I'm simply trying to say this. Even the book of Psalms was talking about who? Jesus. And it didn't end there. Verse 45. Look at verse 45. It says, then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. And what was the scripture? What is it that Jesus, these books were talking about him? It was simply, he said to them, this is what the Bible says, from Genesis to Revelation. Read with me. What does it say? Thus it is written, that what? Christ should suffer, and that on the third day, rise from the dead. Verse 47. And that what? Help me here. Let me come this side for the sake of my friends who think I love that side better than this side. And that what? Help me here repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from where? Now, who is supposed to proclaim? 
Come on, help me. I, I, I want to know whether I know whether I'm, what I'm saying is true. Who is supposed to proclaim that? Was it supposed to be the same Jesus proclaiming? No. He was telling them, listen, as he was opening their eyes in those appearances, he would just appear. Appear. For 40 days and 40 nights. Appearing. Can somebody say appear? appear. That will help you to connect. Appear. appear. This man, I remember the disciples who were at the sea, they were, they were fishing. Peter had already taken, taken them astray. And they were fishing. Again, Jesus appeared. They didn't know it was Jesus. He just appeared. And they had been toiling the whole night without nothing. This is the second time they're getting a draught of fish. And he tells them, put your net back. They put the net back and the fish come. Then he says, let's go home and have dinner. They went and had lunch with Jesus. As they were eating lunch, their eyes opened. Actually, during this season of 40 days and 40 nights, they were only having a party. It was party. It was time of eating and drinking. It was not times for miracles. Because God was reserving the miracle aspect. He was reserving the message for the man that he had chosen to be able to take this message to the world. And those men is you and me who is standing here today. Those men is the church. Are you with me? As soon as they ate the bread after that fishing episode, the Bible says their eyes opened and they saw Jesus. And again, Jesus disappeared. So for the 40 days and for the 40 nights, Jesus was simply making himself known to his disciples, so that without any doubt, they can believe he's alive. And after they have believed he's alive, he would now command them to go into the whole world and proclaim this gospel. Are you listening to me? Yes. To go and announce to the people and tell them, your sins have been forgiven. Go and tell them your deliverance has come. Amen. I feel anointed to tell you, if you are suffering from any demonic attack, Jesus has delivered you already. Because my business is simply to proclaim. Bishop, my pastor, my business is to proclaim. I have no business in delivering you. But when I speak and I proclaim, I say, listen, the Lord has done it. And you believe he has done it. You receive it. Look at verse 40, 48. Verse 48 says, you are witnesses of these things. Now, if you go to verse 49, then he said, behold, Read with me. Behold what? I'm sending the promise of my father. What was that promise? We began by reading that promise. If you love me, you will keep my, and I will ask the father. And he will give you another helper who will be with you always. I said, I am, he said, I am sending the promise of my father upon you. But then he made a commandment. He says, but stay where? In the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Why did he say that? Because Jesus understood they cannot do without the power from on high. He understood they cannot do move even a second without the helper. I want to cascade this and say, synergy is when the church has the helper. Come on, synergy is when the church has an helper. It's when the Holy Ghost is moving in the church. Synergy is when the Holy Spirit becomes resident in our lives. When we have the Holy Ghost in our midst, I can tell you, there is no demon that will stand us. There is no sickness that will stand us. There is no sin that will overtake you. Because you will know you are not operating alone. So he made a promise and he said, he, said, he told them, I will give you another comforter. And I want to finish. I promised you 10 minutes. 15, I told you I'll do it in 15 minutes. I want to promise you, this helper was nobody but the Holy Spirit that will be resident in the lives of the believers. I love when I'm teaching to use some definitions. Because sometimes when you look at a definition, it helps you to connect with the spirit behind the wordings or the meaning behind the wordings. I discovered the word helper. If I could read what I, I, I call helper here. Helper... In my definition, in my dictionary definition, is simply one who gives and provides what is necessary to accomplish a task or satisfy a need. That's the meaning of the word helper. One who does what? Help me read. Who provides, gives or provides what is necessary to accomplish a task or to satisfy a need. Can I bring it to our level? Why do you need a wife as a helper? You can't produce without a wife. Man, you try. Man, you can't. 
But when the woman comes, he helps you, number one, to provide what is necessary to accomplish procreation. And number two, still in that, nini, she satisfies a need. That's a helper. That's what the Bible calls the woman a helper. A helper is to contribute strength to or render assistance to, cooperate effectively with, aid and assist. So when the Lord was talking about a helper, he was talking about somebody who would come in the lives of the believers to give or provide what is necessary. Are you getting me? What is necessary to accomplish a task and to sati or, or satisfy a need. And that helper was nobody but the Holy Spirit. Let's come back to the scripture. This is why when he was now with them, we've read the book of Luke. Those chapters I've read in the book of Luke. And Luke was nobody but this man who had been with Jesus from day one when he was born. Up to the time when Jesus was taken to heaven. The book of Luke is one book in the Bible designed to give us a whole story of Jesus' birth, Jesus', uh, Jesus uh, uh, life. It gives us the, li the, the, the Jesus' ministry, takes us to the G Jesus' death, talks about Jesus', I mean, Jesus uh, burial, and ends up with Jesus uh, uh, resurrecting. And, and the final thing that Luke does, he shows us when Jesus is going on the cross. So when you want to look at the story of Jesus, the book of Luke gives you a full text of what the story of Jesus is. No wonder when Luke was finishing, his, this book, if you look together with me, in the book of Luke chapter, Luke chapter 24 and verse 19, I think we looked at it, but I don't, want, I don't mind reading it again. He said to them, chapter 24 and verse, sorry, 20, uh, 24 verse 49, verse 49. This is what he told them as he was ending the book of Luke. 49, he said, and behold, can you read together? He said, behold what? I'm sending the promise of my father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Look at verse 50, verse 50. 50 says, is there verse 50? Then he blessed them as far as Bethany, lifting up his hands, he blessed them. Verse 51, 51. I think that one is the end. Is it the end? It goes up to 50. 56. Let's read up to 56 for you to capture it. He says, while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up in heaven. 52 says, and they worshipped him and returned where? To Jerusalem with great joy. 53. 53. And they, were con and they continually in the temple blessing God. 54. Eh? Verse. So it ends like that. It ends like that. What am I talking about? Luke gave us a clear picture of what happened. The same Luke is the one who has written the book of Acts. Those who don't know. Matendo ya mitume. It's written by Luke. And Luke was writing this book to a man by the name of Theophilus. I think I tried to explain Theophilus in the services. And somebody on Facebook tried to give me more definitions. Who he clearly told me who Theophilus was. He says Theophilus was one noble man, probably. Okay? He, he was a prominent man. He calls him your excellency. He could have been one of those believers who got saved later on through the ministry of Luke or wherever. But Luke wanted to bring to him into perspective of what exactly happened with Jesus. So when you go to Luke chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, he begins writing the book of Acts, the same Luke. I'm speaking this because I want you to know when a word is emphasized three times or two times, that becomes doctrinal. It becomes a command. Tell your friend it becomes doctrinal. Listen, you, a doctrine is something that is verily, verily. You cannot change it. So Luke has spoken about it in the book of Luke. But look, here he's saying, he says to this man, in the first book, which is that this first book is referring to here, the book of Luke. My first book, St. Luke, he says, O oh, Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Okay, two more minutes and teach. Chapter, chapter, in verse, verse but verse 2, until the day when he was taken up. That's how the book of Luke ends. And he says, after he, had been, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Okay? Verse 3, he presented himself. Very important. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by how many proofs? Many proofs. 
appearing, the word appearing is coming there, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Then Luke drops down the bombshell in verse 4. And he says, and while they were staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard of me. So the promise was a command. It was a promise, a command. He told them, stay in Jerusalem. Jesus has gone up. He says, don't do anything. Stay in Jerusalem until you've received power from on high. And believe me, the disciples, like we have seen in the book of Luke, they went to Jerusalem and they stayed in the house praising the Lord. Thank God, Luke didn't end there. Again in verse, eight, in, in, in verse, in verse 5, he says, For John baptized with what? With water. But you will be, help me here. How will you be baptized? With the Holy Spirit, not many days forth. Hence, from now. And it took 10 days. After 10 days, the day of Pentecost came. Again, look in verse 8. Go to verse 8. Verse 8, he says, but, help me, you will do what? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Beginning from where? Where Jesus had said, Jerusalem and Judea and where? And then where? Can you mention where you come from and where? That is, the, that is what the Lord left for the church to do. I believe it is the church that is carrying the message. Thank you, Pastor Joyce. Let me repeat again. I believe it is the church that is carrying the good news. I believe it is the church that is proclaiming. To proclaim is to announce. Telling the world Jesus is alive. It is the church which is saying you are saved. Telling you your sins have been forgiven. And again, allow me to declare here. Every one of you, you've been forgiven. Amen. Only thing you need to do, believe. And once you believe, you come to Jesus. And once you come to him, he baptizes you with the Holy Ghost. And when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you begin living a holy life. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. I will stop there. I will pick it up in my next sermon. Thank you for listening to me. And thank you for being in this service. God bless you. God keep you. And God be with you. Could we stand up on our feet? We make our closing prayer and we leave. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Lord, we give you praise.